And we are back for round two. It's retro ups and downs. If you didn't see it last week, make sure you go check out my thoughts on the Raw Rumble 2000. And I was only just over that, and then you lovely folk voted in ECW One Night Stand 2005. So at the moment, the theme of retro ups and downs is, let's just show Simon the most violent, the most aggressive, and the most brutal chair shots and weapon shots and thumbtack spots as possible and see what happens to him. Well, I'll tell you what happens. I cry. I not cry. Just water happens to come out of my eyes, but I'm still really tough. But like I say, you guys are in control. Make sure on Tuesday you go to the What Culture YouTube community feed and vote. And make sure you put comments down there right now to let us know what you want the vote to be. Put your favorite shows. But for now, let's up those downs for One Night Stand 2005. The most ridiculous thing about ECW One Night Stand from 2005 is that during the same weekend, other ECW people that weren't affiliated with this one went out over the weekend and they did their own show. So you didn't have any extreme championship wrestling for years and then all of a sudden, what? was throwing up over you. With that said, what a flipping couple of days it was if you were a hardcore fan of that organization. It was like nothing had changed and that secretly it had never gone out of business because Shane Douglas was heading up the other event known as Hardcore Homecoming. Well, you know, what he started doing is he got a fake gun out of his pocket and he lined it up against Superman Man and he went pow pow and he started firing shots. So some wars never end, but if you really want to get the feel for this, go and watch the Bite This episode that I think aired on the Thursday before the pay-per-view where Tommy Dreamer and Paul Heyman sit down and they just work shoot their ass off. Now in 2020, we're all like, oh, we're so smart, we understand work shoots. Nobody knew what they were back in 2005, and really all Paul Heyman was doing was telling the truth, but then pretending it was a work. You will not believe some of the things they say. For some final context, do not forget that the reason this damn pay-per-view happened to begin with is that WWE released that ECW, the Rise and Fall DVD, and it sold so many copies, the money men, the power players were like, look, we better do something with this, otherwise we have gone nuts. Even your nan owes a copy of that DVD. Seriously, go look at her shelf. You see like Gone With The Wind, Casablanca, Annie, and then she has ECW One Night Stand. And when you're in bed, she watches it. She's like, ah, oh, get them, Sabu. She loves tables. It did all indeed lead to this night where it was so popular that people trying to order it through WWE.com were so vast, they crashed the flipping website. Ooh, de lally. As for One Night Stand itself, again, what numpty decided to start doing this and watching shows such as this when we're living in a global pandemic where current wrestling doesn't have any fans? I'm the numpty. I'm the idiot. You, I can't believe how loud the audience was. When Joey Styles comes out to welcome them, you would have thought it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's the same for his co-commentator Mick Foley, and I felt like such a schmoz watching it that I'm giving myself a down. That's right, first time ever at Ups and Downs, I'm giving it a Simon Down, or a Simon Moron Down, or Idiot Simon Down. Why is it my name David? And I give it the David Down. Thanks a lot, parents. Once again, just not doing anything for me. Or Darren, Darren would have done, but no, I'm stupid Simon Jeremy Miller. Jeremy works even less. All this craziness continued into the first match, which was Lance Storm taking on Chris Jericho. And you know their story. They started training together. They were a tag team. And they just have incredible chemistry. And when both guys come out, I don't want to run the point home, but I will. It was almost as if everybody in the crowd had been told, oh, these two are here to save your life and give you a check for a million dollars. It is it up. Laying waste to this idea that it's only in the modern day where you get like move, 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 spot, 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 arm drag, arm drag, arm drag, then both get up and stare at each other. That's the first thing that Jericho and Storm does here. And surprise, surprise, they're over like Rover. Dawn Marie is also in the corner of Lance and the crowd actually starts chanting at her, you're a crack whore. And I feel bad even saying it. And then they do indeed turn their attention to the Canadian and they tell him to flub off. That's not what they said. They're not going flub you Lance you can figure it out. This whole thing was put there to light a fire under everybody so they would get so excited. And that is doubly true when Just Incredible, who of course was part of the Impact players, Lance Storm's tag team partner, runs out, smashes Chris Jericho right in the head, and then Lance Storm is able to pin him and get the one, two, three. It was doubly bad for Y2J because seconds before that, he had Lance Storm in the walls of Jericho, but Dawn Marie got on the apron. So as he is still saying right now in AEW, we were screwing a champion even before he was a champion. It's just really fun, to be honest. You can forget everything and just soak in the atmosphere 
But I did have a moment and I was like, this is 15 years old. How is it 15 years old? I'm going to be dead soon. I better plan my funeral. Our first major storyline of the night then came into play as we focused on a balcony with a bunch of chairs. As our commentary team told us, that is where Team WWE is going to be sitting. Because of course, that was the narrative here. ECW hated WWE. WWE hated ECW. And the World Wrestling Entertainment dudes were going to invade this pay-per-view. Although we were then informed they'd all bought tickets. That is a crappy way to invade. And this mostly situated around the likes of Eric Bischoff, JBL, Kurt Angle, Edge, Christian, Carlito, Tyson, Tomko. And their major goal was to shut down the show and kill ECW for good. And imagine they had actually succeeded. And halfway through one let stand like, Doom, like in the Ghostbusters, Doom, all the lights went off. You would be pissed. Anyway, before that, we got a package focusing on the ECW alumni that had very sadly passed away. I mean, they talked about Chris Candido, they talked about Crash Holly, they talked about Big Dick Dudley, and it's still horrible to watch this. You don't really want to pass away, especially when Chris Candido's, like, you know, born to death numbers came up. He was like 33 years old. It's just unbelievable. Match two followed, and it was a three-way dance, and not a disgusting, crappy triple threat match. And boy, how did Joey Styles want to drive that home? I mean, he may as well just dropped his trousers and waved everything around. He was so horrified about what World Wrestling Entertainment had done to this concept. However, it was little Guido, or Nunzio, taken on Super Crazy, taken on Tajiri, and you can just imagine what happened here is getting it up. And of course, if you don't know, the rules for this kind of thing in ECW were that you do have three people going at it, but as soon as somebody is pinned, they're out of there, and then you have a standard one-on-one -on -one match. Once again, just to give the crowd exactly what they wanted, they went at a pace akin to about 700 miles an hour and just did all these crazy moves that made you want to take your head and put it in a fish bowl that they nibbled away because it was just so violent and just so nuts. And at one point, even Mick Foley went, look, I don't know the names of any of these moves, so maybe I'll just sit back and let you do it, Joey Styles. And it just reminded me, I love Mick Foley. Like, he could go out there and commit a really bad crime and I'd hear about it and go, nah, it's just Mick Foley. He'll be okay. Some of the shib they did too. You would never get away with any of this now. If you're like in a big American promotion. Like Super Crazy goes out into the fans at one point and does a moonsault off the top of it, which was crazy anyway, but <laughs> super crazy. And yeah, sure, he hits his opponents, but he also takes out half the people around him. So if you had turned up as an ECW audience member, you were also having your ass kicked. A bunch of bad guys then got involved, which Tadiri had to fight off, but it also allowed Mikey Whipwreck to just appear and hit the whippersnapper onto little Guido, Guido, whatever we're calling him. Tajiri pinned him. He was gone. It's the crazy one versus the dude that spits the mist. Crazy and Taj went at it for a little bit, but it was here I was reminded, oh yeah, I always enjoy the enthusiasm of the ECW crowd, but they can also be a bunch of dicks. Because they made a mistake here. There was a weird botch where there was a timing issue. And do you think they ignored this? No, they didn't. They just screamed at them. Ha ha ha. You flubbed up for around about a minute, a minute straight. Crazy followed this all up though with one of the stiffest power bombs you're ever likely to see and a moonsault from the top rope and he got the victory. And if you're wondering why they made sure it came down to these two, well, they had a pretty legendary feud back in the day. You see, we are ticking those boxes. A cool video then aired reminding us all how great ECW used to be. And then it was Psychosis versus Rey Mysterio. And if you need any more evidence that Rey was brilliant from the moment he walked into the Bears Nest till now, well, this is something you can watch. It's an up. With that said, going back to what we were talking about earlier, one of the biggest issues with Extreme Championship Wrestling when it is in its pomp are the people watching it. Because again, they're so awesome about how into it they are. But if you make any kind of mistake, they will jump down your throat like a coin had gone down there. And if they get that coin, it allows them to buy a really big house. And I just think it's too much. And yeah, I get it. I'm a bald asshole. I'm a moron. I'm a wuss. I'm a baby. I need to grow up. But I actually think it takes you out of the experience. Especially when they started chanting at Rey Mysterio, you sold out. What does that concept even mean? Well, he took a bigger contract in the employment line that he's in to support his family. Oh yeah, Rey Mysterio, you sold out. Well, you know what? Again, like I say, it took me out of all of this, down. Otherwise, this is fire and bonkers. Like at one point, Psychosis rests Rey Mysterio over the guardrail and he gives him a leg drop on top of it and I don't understand how Ray's head stayed on his body. And this isn't me telling one of my stupid jokes. I actually mean it in any other walk of life he would get decapitated. The rest of this is just insane as the two fly around as if they think they're in an AEW tag team match. And before long, Rey Mysterio hits the 619, the springboard Frankensteiner, and he does get the 123. Crowd still booing though. How dare he go to WWE? That did knock this down a peg or two, because I think we're just giving Ray a hard time for the wrong reasons. 
So yes, that's right. I am now standing in as Rey Mysterio's dad, which technically makes me Rey Mysterio, because he's Rey Mysterio Jr. I'll do it. See, there you go. I told you I could stand in, and stand in I shall. Also, whoever was booking this had clearly thought to themselves, right, three matches is enough, and then we can bring in the WWE guys, as Team SmackDown starts to walk to their seats. And as soon as everybody sees Kurt Angle, the amount of boos is genuinely hilarious. Especially because they do start shouting at them that not only can they all go suck a dick, but they can also go and flub themselves. Once again, they're not saying the word flub. I laugh when they were chanting it. I laugh when I was writing it down. I'm laughing inside down. And I get it makes me a little bit of a hypocrite, but you just, you never hear this kind of stuff now. And you can't help but go, hee hee hee, like you're nine. Clearly prepped for this though, my word. As Kurt Angle does get on the microphone to try and address them, they continue to chant that he is a person that likes to suck dick. And the Olympic gold medalist responds, he shouts, well, yeah, you know what? Your mother taught me how. Oh my gosh. This is an absolute hoot to watch, I tell you. And if the idea was to make it feel like you're watching some kind of alien version of WWE, well, mission succeed. Angle was brilliant here too, and even went back to the very true story about how when he first saw an ECW show, he walked out because he thought it was so rubbish. And yeah, that actually happened. It was when the Sandman and Raven tried to crucify each other. Well, that's what Raven tried to do. And he was so disgusted and didn't really know what pro wrestling was. He was like, well, if that's what it is, I want no part of it. So ECW almost robbed us of Kurt Angle, the professional wrestler. JBL Sue joined in, but he was equally as non-WWE because he was all like, you're all a bunch of fat losers. The only reason you like ECW is that it's lowbrow entertainment, so you actually believe that you could make it to that level. Whereas if you tried to make it to my level, you wouldn't get close, you absolute morons. The sheer hatred from both sides, though, is absolutely nuts. That's because it's real. That's because it's real. You know that JBL doesn't think much of this, and you know the fans hate somebody like JBL. It is so easy to buy into, and all of that is getting it up. It then gets even more fibbly sticks because RVD is out here. I mean, it's like, oh, the crowd's not making enough noise. Send Rob Van Dam out there. Trust me, they were making enough noise. And he gets the microphone too, and it's just truth hour with Rob Van Dam. He's like, my, I got injured, my knee's done, I had to have surgery, I can't wrestle. And for me, this sucks even more than missing WrestleMania. Vince McMahon probably having a heart attack. Before he can get anywhere though, as if he just transported in using one of those Star Trek transport thingies, Rhino is in the ring, and then he gores Rob Van Dam like he owed him money. I think they went through the floor. Everyone wanted to die during this just because they assumed that's what the audience wanted. And never was this more true than when the lights went out and when they came back on, who was standing in the middle of the ring? It was flipping Sabu. The pop from this woke up my nan, which is very troubling because she's been dead for a few years. And I can only presume a very young wizard in the sky was responsible here because then by magic, we were indeed getting Rhino versus Sabu. Now this is a very acquired taste, but it's enough. And I will say that this is a little hard to watch given what we know now about CTE and concussions. And one of the chair shots from Sabu to Rhino is so hard and it is so heavy and it is so intense, I think it took 10 years off my own life. And then the referee was getting gored and RVD ran in and he like did a Van Terminator thing about Bob with another chair into Rhino's face, poor Rhino's face. And by the time Sabu had taken another chair and dropped his leg over Rhino's flipping neck, he got pinned and Sabu won. And then I had to go have an ice shower. Have an ice shower and think about like fairies and rainbows and donuts. Just three lovely things that make you feel good inside. I mean, flubbing, flubbing hell. There was a quick Al Snow promo with Head because of course this is where all started when the Raw guys arrived led by Edge. Without missing a beat, Joey Styles says, <laughs> there's Edge, I'm glad my wife isn't here right now. To remind people that ECW was a lot more than just blood and guts, we were then getting Eddie Guerrero versus Chris Benoit and before we get into it, we do have to address the elephant in the room. While it always causes a stink, and let's try not to have it cause a stink, I would admit that I haven't watched any Chris Benoit matches since 2007, because I just haven't been able to. I think what he did outside the wrestling ring is so horrific and so awful, I've just never been able to get my head around it. And I know that there's people in better positions that can comment on it, and I also understand that CTE probably played a huge role, that's just how I feel, that's how I take it, so I do take a more somber tone when talking about Chris Benoit matches during these retro reviews, you're just gonna have to forgive me. Back to this, and the fans spent most of the time shouting Edge flubbed Lita, again, not the word flubbed, and you screwed Matt, because of course, yes, as hinted at earlier, this was during the time that Matt Hardy had been out injured, Edge started to have an affair with Lita, who was Matt Hardy's girlfriend, and somehow the fallout of all of that was that Matt Hardy got fired. I mean, talk about someone kicking you when you're down. 
That'd be like you losing your lottery ticket that you won billions of dollars on and your girlfriend going, you're a loser, I'm leaving you. At this point, he hadn't been rehired either. Thankfully, now we know he would be. What a crappy time it was for the broken one. And as for the match itself, this was really good because I don't think these two were actually possible in having a bad one. I and mean, it was technical and it was smart and it was just so smooth. Like a couple of swans flying through a lake. And eventually Eddie Guerrero did tap out when the Crippler crossface got applied. Even the WWE guys were shown standing up applauding this. And to be fair, you know, Benoit and Guerrero were more WWE guys then than they had been in the past. And it gets it up. Eric Bischoff then just grabbed a microphone and he started to run down ECW. And if the idea of these promos is to generate heat, then you didn't need to do it because it was so hot in the damn place, you could have, I don't know, exploded a volcano. I don't even know what that means. And then as if what we hadn't already seen wasn't bonkers enough, we got Matsawa Tanaka taking on Mike Awesome. Now I'm gonna guess if you're a brand new fan, you may never have heard of either of these two guys, but if you go and watch this, I promise you from the bottom of my feet, you will never forget them. And I'm 99% sure what they were told before they left to go to the ring was that, look, if you, both of you come back to this area when all is said and done, I will kill both of you. I don't know what this is, some kind of weapon. So all right, well, one of us is gonna have to die. Let's try and do it out there in front of a live flipping audience. It was also a terrible line in hindsight from Joey Styles when after Mike Awesome had done a suicide dive, Joey went, well, it's a shame he wasn't successful in taking his own life. And as we know, a few years later, Mike Awesome did die because he committed suicide. Now, Joey Styles obviously wasn't going to know that at the time. And it all tied into the fact that he left ECW under very bad circumstances. But when you watch stuff like that, I'm like, man, I want to go home. And once again, all you need to know is that Awesome hit Tanaka with such a chair shot. I only think to make that Sabu one from earlier look like a chicken giving you a kiss. But do you remember when The Rock hit Ken Shamrock with that chair? Remember that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing compared to this. I, I'll never get past it. I never will. I have nightmares about this. What the hell happened to Tanaka's head? Then there was an elbow drop into what must have been around about 66,749 chairs. And because I didn't remember the finish to this, I was like, how are we going to top that? What the hell is coming next? Because, yeah, it didn't end nothing. And how it did all come to a close was Mike Awesome doing the awesome bomb over the top rope to Tanaka, who then fell through a flipping table and smashed his back on the floor. And then Awesome just threw himself at the man over the top rope and he managed to get the one, two, three. Mike then destroyed the referee too for one reason because screw that guy. And I promise you this, you will never see something like this on a Vince McMahon promoted event ever again. Not in 2020. I'm almost shocked that it happened in 2005 and I haven't even told you the half of it. Some of the power bombs through broken tables and just everything else. I don't know how they walked after this. I wouldn't be able to. In fact, my knee hurts and I'm just stood here like a giant nerd. But it was meant to be car wreck TV and when it comes to that, they absolutely nailed it, which means it does get it up. I then think we got the highlight of the whole show when Mr. ECW himself, that being Paul Heyman, arrived to a hero's welcome and got a microphone. And while I'm sure someone had said, look, Paul, you can say whatever you want. Make sure you give it to them. I also just have a slight inkling that Heyman went, well, they'll probably find me in the future anyway. So even though I know where the line is, Let's just step over it and have a rolly old good time. Up. Not only did he give a true heartfelt thank you to the fans, which I actually thought was quite nice, he then turned his attention to Eric Bischoff and basically laughed at him like, <laughs> where's your WCW comeback event? It doesn't exist. We're here in ECW. And then saw Edge and just shouted out, hide your wives. And we've talked about it. We've talked about it. And Heyman continued on by just going, Matt Hardy, Matt Hardy. He was just saying a fired employee's name into the microphone. JBL was always going to get something too. And this was probably the best line of the decade. Because Paul found him with his eyes, they locked pupils, and he said, don't forget that the only reason you were world champion for over a year is because Triple H didn't want to work Tuesdays. This, of course, was a reference to the game who was basically destroying Raw during this time. And he's right. It's 100% true. If Hunter Hearst Helms had woken up one day and went, uh, Vince, I want to be on SmackDown, Bradshaw would have lost that belt before you could say Bradshaw is a bully and asshole. We're 15 years removed from this, and I bet deep down John Bradshaw Layfield still isn't over this. And this is also an all-time promo. And if you're a wrestling fan and you haven't seen it, go and change that now. We then got our main event, and it was never going to be able to live up to everything else that we'd seen. The only way you were going to be able to achieve that was by putting the entire audience in a DeLorean and sending them back in time and have them forget all the other madness we've seen. But even then, it was still pretty damn insane up. It was the Dudleys taking on Tommy Dreamer and Sandman, and good grief did these guys enjoy their entrances 
they must have been taking tips from The Undertaker. I mean, look, it was really cool seeing the Sandman come out to enter Sandman by Metallica, this time legally, we're not gonna get into it, but he probably would have done this for another 42 years unless somebody shouted him, Sandman, get in the ring, you're meant to be fighting. Before we could start it though, the BWO were in the ring and they were just running everything down and that emptied the locker room, so we got a massive brawl and eventually that did calm down and do you know what the first thing we saw was? Bubba Ray Dudley took a cheese grater and started cheese gratering Tommy Dreamer's face. Nobody wants that as a condom on the side. Also, you're not meant to cheese great. Look at this. You're not meant to cheese great people's faces. Then there was Blood Ladders, Justin Incredible and Lance Storm tombstoned Sandman onto some barbed wire. And I don't really understand what ECW was. I used to watch it back in the day and I was rabid for this stuff. I've clearly become an old man. Somebody give me a big beard, a big wig and a, a cane. And I was walking around, it's too much for me. It's too much. I was terrified about how this was going to end because you knew they were going to take it up to some kind of nuts levels which they did when Spike Dudley ran out to help his fake brothers, set a table on fire, and then Bubba Ray closed my eyes to pretend it didn't exist. Bubba Ray powerbombed Tommy Dreamer through it, and the Dudley boys won. Sandman eventually made the save because the Dudley just kept hammering on Tommy Dreamer after this, and because he was desperate for a beer, then the glass shattered, and out came Stone Cold Steve Austin. And even after two and a half hours of non-stop action, this crowd went absolutely ballistic. The rattlesnake has all the power. Being that he is the bionic redneck, he also looked at the WWE guys and he's like, well, you're meant to be the big boys in town. Why don't you come in here and have a fight with the big ECW guys? So they did. It finally ended after a massive fight, which didn't look too out of place for a Raw Rumble. And then Eric Bischoff basically received every single person's finishing move, because when it comes to ECW, nobody was more hated than the man that ran WCW. He did steal a lot of their talent. The only real shame here is that it was during this brawl when JBL decided that he was going to beat up the Blue Meanie for real. And I mean that literally. He made his way to the BWO member and hit him in the face so hard, so many times, that it looked like he'd been thrown through a window. The Blue Meanie's face was covered in blood. This was all too because on the grapevine, Bradshaw had heard that Blue Meanie had called him a bully, but he was a bully. Because you know what a bully would do if they heard they were a bully? They'd go out there and bully, and JBL, he'd be bullying. It's horrible to watch this, and now the two have made up, which is good. But in the world of professional wrestling, which is all meant to be about respect and trust, it goes just into the garden here. I'll tell you this, it's disgusting. And it's also awful no matter what the year, and a mighty prick move. And I can't do much, but I can do this. So you, John Bradshaw Layfield, get it down. Following up from last week too, a big thing that people wanted more of, they said, oh, we want to know what Dave Meltzer gave all the ratings because people love star ratings. So I thought, okay, we'll do that. And I have rung up Dave Meltzer and I've got him involved. So we'll do this at the end of every single retro show. Roll this. Hello, my name is really fine. Belv Keltzer and I'm here to remind you of what I gave the matches at ECW One Night Stand 2005 when it came to my star rating. Well, Lance Storm versus Chris Jericho got 3.25 stars. A three-way dance got 2.5 stars. Ray versus Psychosis also got 2.5 stars. Sabu versus Rhino, where someone almost died, 3.25 stars. Benoit versus Guerrero, 3.25 stars. Mike Awesome versus Tanaka got 4.25 stars. And the final main event, the Dudley Boys versus the Sandman and Tommy Dreamer got 3.25 stars. And there you have it, my ratings, Maeve Deltzer, coming at you, I'm not doing this. I refuse to do this. I was put up to this by the idiots in the truck over there. My name is Flippin' Marks. I represent the Kayfabe News Network. And while I will bring you these ratings each and every week, I will not be part of this preposterous charade. Thanks. Well, I kind of lied. But either way, what an absolutely nuts event this is. If you want a window back into the late 90s, I suppose, although in 2005, you should watch it. I can't lie, I had a good time. It's like mob mentality. When it was done, I was like, I want more war, I want more carnage, and I wouldn't give it anything other but it up. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below with your suggestion for what we review next week. You can have anything you want. It could be ECW, WCW, WWE. You pick your promotion. We'll find the ones that get the most upvotes. We'll put them in the poll. You're in control. Like the video, share the video, smash that subscribe button. Make sure you watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. Follow What Culture, What Culture, WWE. And there's a website, it's called whatculture.com. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you so much for supporting Retro Ups and Downs. I'm having a rollicking good time, but I need your support. And I'll see you soon.